My topic is the same as the book. I'll try not to give it all away since I hope you'll buy it. But uh, it is the unintended consequences of the Iraq war and what we should be doing about it. Uh, first, I think it's worth reflecting on what was it, it, what was supposed to be accomplished by the Iraq war. Obviously, it was meant to rid Iraq of weapons of mass destruction. And in that sense, you could say it was totally successful. Uh, but if you took a somewhat broader view of the question of weapons of mass destruction, it was intended to make the United States more secure against rogue states having weapons of mass destruction. Uh, as President, put it, President Bush put it in 2002, the worst regimes having the most dangerous weapons. And of course, the most dangerous of those weapons is one that Iraq, that nobody thought Iraq was uh, uh, in any, any, anywhere close to uh, acquiring, in fact, it had no program at all, which is nuclear weapons. But there are uh, two other states in the axis of evil uh, which had nuclear programs. And so the question is, by using that narrow standard, are we more secure? Are, are we less threatened by rogue states with nuclear weapons? Well. Uh, Iran, in 2003, when we launched the Iraq War, had, uh, had had a uranium enrichment program, uh, but it had suspended that program in 2003. Two years later, in 2005, as things were going badly for the United States in Iraq, Iran resumed uranium enrichment and is today in the process of mastering the technology necessary to, to enrich uranium, which is the most difficult step that is in the process of making a nuclear weapon, that is uh, acquiring or de the, the fissile material, the explosive material. Uh, North Korea, the other member of the Axis of Evil, uh, in 2002 was a party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and a party to a 1994 agreement with the Clinton administration in which its nuclear reactor was uh, subject to IAE safeguards and, uh, and its activities, plutonium research activities suspended. Uh, in 2002, the Bush administration ripped up that 1994 agreement and said it was uh, insufficiently strict on the North Koreans. The North Koreans then uh, expelled the inspectors. They withdrew from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. They took the plutonium that had been under safeguards. They made eight or nine nuclear weapons. And in 2007, they exploded one of them. Uh, so by that measure in, uh, of uh, making the US more secure from rogue states with weapons of mass destruction. We have one of the axis of evil with nuclear weapons. We have another that has a, a advanced significantly its capability. Uh, and of course, Iraq didn't have anything at all. Uh, the war in Iraq was intended to spread democracy in the Middle East. Uh, the Iraqis, the line went, were the Germans of the Middle East. And once you got rid of their Adolf Hitler, uh, because they were industrious um, and uh, uh, well-educated, secular, they would um, build a, a, a model democracy under American tutelage. And then a democratic Iraq would be a subversive force uh, as regards uh, uh, Iran and Syria and then after those regimes toppled, we might eventually see other authoritarian regimes in the Middle East, uh, including some American allies like uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, democratize. In short, the idea was democracy in Iraq would be a bit what uh, solidarity in Poland and reform in Hungary were in 1989, 
uh, the, the start of a revolution that changed Eastern Europe and, and changed the world. The problem was that democracy uh, didn't come to Iraq. Uh, the country had free elections, but it fragmented. Kurdistan in the north uh, emerged as a de facto independent state with its uh, it has its own elected government. It has its own army. Uh, it flies its own flag. It's uh, illegal for the Iraqi army to come to Kurdistan. Uh, it's, it was, uh, until uh, this year, illegal to fly the Iraqi flag. Now there's a modified Iraqi flag, so they fly it in one or two places. Uh, it controls its own borders. Uh, and it has a border, hard border, with the rest of Iraq. Uh, it is pro-Western, it is democratic, it's just not part of Iraq. In the case of the uh, Shiites, uh, in 2005, uh, they took full power of the central government in southern Iraq, in local elections in southern Iraq, and in the parliamentary elections that were held in January and December of 2005. And in power, they have created a Iranian-style uh, theocratic government in which the human rights provisions of the Iraqi constitution are totally irrelevant. The rule of law doesn't apply. Um, and uh, in the case of the Sunnis, Initially, the Sunni areas were uh, the base of an insurgency that was uh, started by the former Ba'athists. Then you had the Al-Qaeda and the, the Salafi jihadi element there. And now we have uh, the awakening, these tribal sheikhs who have formed their own militia, who are former Ba'athists. Anyhow, none of those groups, the Ba'athists, the um, Al-Qaeda uh, movement, or the awakening is in any way democratic. Uh, so Iraq did not become a functioning democracy. Uh, and it had no, you, you didn't have the desired domino effect. In fact, it was really the opposite. Uh, the, in Iran in 2003, you had a, a moderate regime under President Hatami, but he was then replaced by the hardliner the Ahmadinejad. The Syrian government uh, was losing power in 2003 and in fact reached its nadir in 2005 when it was caught red-handed in the assassination of uh, Lebanese, former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri, uh, but since then has consolidated uh, power and is in a much stronger position. And there's no sign of change or reform uh, anyplace else. Uh, in, in Saudi Arabia or Egypt or in that many uh, other places in the Middle East, maybe some progress in Lebanon. Uh, the Iraq war was intended to make the United States more secure in the war on terror. Uh, well, in fact, there was no presence of Al-Qaeda uh, in Iraq prior to uh, the U.S. invasion. Uh, but it is true that Iraq did become the central front in the war on terror, because Al-Qaeda came there. Uh, and there are some people who argue that this was a, a brilliant result, because uh, we attracted them to Iraq, where we could fight them. Uh, but the fact is that it, they did. this was not a case of where they moved from Iraq. While we were tied down in Iraq, they gained in strength in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. Uh, they are a major force in the tribal areas in Pakistan. Uh, and increasingly, the Taliban is controlling more and more of Afghanistan. So the very people who brought us September 11, 11 are in the strongest position they've been since 2001. Uh, and finally, the Iraq war was meant to uh, uh, consolidate America's leadership in the world as the world's only superpower uh, and uh, strengthen our preeminence. But 
as it turns out, the, that uh, Iraq has uh, damaged America's reputation around the world. Uh, the incompetence with which the Bush administration conducted the occupation of Iraq has uh, very much undermined uh, America's reputation for efficiency and doing things well. Uh, the war is unpopular almost every place outside of Kurdistan. Uh, people in Kurdistan, the incompetence that has so shocked Americans and others, uh, the Kurds are, are very approving uh, because they, they feel that George Bush did exactly what they wanted him to do. He screwed up Iraq. But that's a very particular point of view. Uh, anyhow, American prestige ha in the world has never been lower. Uh, we've never had a president who was held with such, viewed with such contempt and such dislike. Uh, to take just one example, in the year 2000, 60% of people in Turkey had, according to the Pew Charitable Trust, a favorable view of the United States. By 2006, that number was 7%. 83% of Turks had an unfavorable view of the United States. Now, why should we be concerned what Tur Turks think about us? Well, Turkey is the second largest NATO ally. It is a country that is located uh, adjacent to almost all of the major trouble spots that we've been dealing with for the last 20 years to the west is the Balkans, the trouble spot of the 90s. To the northeast is the Caucasus, where Russia and Georgia fought a war. To the east is Iran. To the southeast, Iraq. To the south, Syria and the, and the Middle East. And yet we've been holding up Turkey as a model of a Islamic country that is secular, democratic, and pro-Western. It doesn't help when the country you hold up as the model proudly proclaims in its newspaper, Turkey, the most anti-American country in the world. Uh, and it isn't just that Turkish opinion is against us, it has, concrete, it has had concrete consequences in terms of Turkey's role and cooperation in Iraq among, uh, m among other issues. Uh, if the U.S. has lost has, has suffered in the Iraq war, in fact, I argue in the book that we've lost the Iraq war, and I'll explain why, then the question is, who has won it? The answer to that is completely clear. It is Iran that has won the Iraq war. Uh, in 2002, when President Bush proclaimed the axis of evil of North Korea, Iraq, and Iran, and I have to say that this was a concept that was both geometrically and, and, and historically challenged. Geometrically and historically challenged. Because uh, as you learned from high school geometry, or possibly grade school geometry, an axis is between two points and not three. And if you know, and here we are at the Atlanta History Center, uh, in the World War II, the Axis was an alliance between Germany and Italy, hence the Rome-Berlin Axis. Japan was an ally, but it wasn't actually a part of the Axis. But the point is that they were allies. In 2002, Iraq and Iran were the most bitter enemies in the world. They had fought in the 1980s an eight-year war, World War I, type war, fitting that we think of it today, the 90th anniversary of the end of World War I, and really the only war like World War I fought in the trenches with poison gas. Uh, and the uh, Iranians who continued this war for many years after Iraq, which started, it was prepared to give up, continued the war because their strategic goal was to get rid of Saddam Hussein and to put their allies in charge of Iraq, their Shiite allies. They failed during the Iran-Iraq war. But in 2003, the United States came in. It removed Saddam Hussein, uh, for whom no tears should ever be shed, 
uh, and then allowed, then set about unintentionally to allow or, or cause the destruction of those institutions that had allowed uh, the Sunni Arabs, who had been the major, who had been who were the 20 percent of Iraq's population, but who had ruled the country from its founding in 1921 until April 9, 2003, uh, the institutions that allowed them to to, to rule, namely uh, the army, which we defeated and then dissolved. The bureaucracy, which, because we had no plan to provide security uh, <clears throat> in Baghdad when we arrived, in fact, we had done no planning at all, no worthwhile planning. Uh, the, all the looters systematically destroyed all the government offices. And then um, the U.S. occupation chief, Jerry Brimmer, fired the top bureaucrats because, of course, he banned people in the senior ranks of the Ba'ath Party from public service, and all of them had had to join the, the uh, public, the, um, the Ba'ath Party. So uh, <clears throat> you well, eliminated that pillar of uh, Sunni power, and then we dissolved the Ba'ath Party. The Sunnis then, having lost power and lost the institutions by which they had controlled Iraq, were out, uh, the U.S. then set about even before the 2005 elections, installing in the new Iraqi army and in the new Iraqi bureaucracy and in the uh, provincial governments in the oil-rich southern part of the country, the political parties, the, the personnel from the political parties and from the militias of the political parties that were most closely aligned with Iran. Particularly, in particular, the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, now renamed the uh, Supreme Iraqi Islamic Council. This was a party that was founded in Tehran in 1982 by Khomeini and is now the, the most important Shiite party in Iraq. Uh, and it controls much of the South and controls the military. Uh, its ally is the Dawa Party which also was supported by Iran, and, with, and one of whose apparatchiks was uh, Nouri al-Maliki, who's now the prime minister of Iraq. In short, we turned, we got rid of Saddam Hussein and actively insist, assisted Iran's closest allies in the world to take over the central government in Baghdad and the south. So where there was no Tehran-Baghdad axis in 2002, there is the strongest alliance today. Uh, and indeed, Iraq has produced the greatest strategic gain in, for Iran since the Treaty of Khazar-e-Sharin in 1639 demarcated the current border of Iraq and Iran, then the border between the Persian and the Ottoman empires. So uh, if um, we have a situation then where uh, a war that uh, has gone badly for us, Iran has emerged as the victor. Now, one of the points I argue in this book is indeed that the Iraq war is lost. Uh, and you may ask, how can you say that? Hasn't the surge been a success? Well, let me explain. The surge, of course, refers to the new strategy that uh, the United States adopted, that President Bush adopted in January of 2007, that involves sending in 20% more troops uh, and instead of keeping them in bases, having them based among the population. And this is widely credited or credited by many people for the decline in violence. Well, first, let, let me, let's be clear. There has been an enormous decline in violence in Iraq, and that is an extremely positive development. Uh, but <clears throat> this is, I would argue, more coincident with the surge than caused by the surge. Uh, and I don't say that for the purpose of taking credit away 
but because if you look at why the violence has declined, it actually is very, it should raise a great deal of concern in terms of what it is we might hope to accomplish. Uh, the main reason that violence declined in 2007 is because of the movement called the Awakening. Basically what happened was in beginning in Anbar, the large province in central Iraq, uh, which is 98% Sunni, the tribal sheikhs came to the US military and said, we would like to fight Al Qaeda. Would you be willing to finance a militia, which we would create and we'll fight uh, Al Qaeda? And the US military commanders had the wit and wisdom to say, yes. Uh, they recognized that the previous strategy of using the Iraqi army to fight al-Qaeda was not working because the Iraqi army is a Shiite institution. And so they said yes, and they began fi fi uh, funding these tribal sheikhs. Uh, and in a rather short period of time, they in fact dealt a very severe blow to al-Qaeda and Anbar. This spread to Baghdad. Uh, to Saladin, which is where Saddam's home province, and, uh, and, and they're just beginning in Nineveh around Mosul. Uh, but it's important to understand why the tribal sheikhs agreed to do this and who these people are. They're not uh, 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 Iraqi Democrats who all of a sudden you know, decide to stand up and they're not uh, 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 jihadis or al-Qaeda types who had a conversion on the road to Damascus. Uh, they, are, they are the people who had been running this part of Iraq for Saddam Hussein up until 2003. And when we removed them in 2003, they did not like it and they started the insurgency. That insurgency, however, was joined by the Salafi jihadis. These are uh, Sunni fundamentalists who consider, who, who are pledged to fighting the infidels, that's uh, the non Muslims, and even more committed to fighting apostates, people who had been Muslim but who weren't anymore in, 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 by their definition of who is a Muslim, namely the Shiites, those from the, uh, this other branch of Islam. And as long as these Salafi jihadis, of which Al-Qaeda is one group, and not all, although we use Al-Qaeda to describe them, not all of them, or most of them are not directly affiliated with the guy in, who's in some cave in Pakistan or Afghanistan. Um, but anyhow, these guys were very happy to have the Salafi jihadis and the Al-Qaeda people fighting alongside them against the Americans and against the Shiites. But then uh, the jihadis and Al-Qaeda began to gain the upper hand, partly because they were so brutal and they had such good public relations. I mean, they, they did these videotaped beheadings and they, they staged spectacular suicide attacks that killed thousands of Shiite pilgrims, innocent civilians. Uh, that didn't bother these Sunni sheikhs. They were perfectly happy with that. But then, then the, the fundamentalists began to um, a, 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 a ask the sheikhs for money, shake them down. Uh, excuse that bad pun. Uh, and they began to forced their daughters into marriage with the, their, the, with the fighters. That, that's just, forced marriage is just another word for rape. And the last straw, they began assassinating the sheikhs. And at that point, the sheikhs then realized that they didn't want to be allied with al-Qaeda. They asked the US for help. But there's no change in the nature of who these people are. They are the same people who had been running Iraq up until 2003, and who we invaded the country to remove. Well, we've got, and we've created now an army of 100,000 militia, uh, which we've been paying for. Uh, how does the, Sh the Iraqi government, which is led, dominated by Shiite religious parties, how does it see these people? 
it sees them as the enemy. In fact, it sees them as a bigger enemy than Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda killed thousands of, of Shiites, but it, had, it was never a threat to take over Iraq. In the view of the Iraqi government, the awakening, which is led by many officers in Saddam Hussein's army, is a threat. So uh, the success has come by creating a, a Sunni army, which serves, uh, very much serves our purposes of fighting Al-Qaeda, and I welcome it. But it is also uh, sowing the tensions of further and escalated conflict between the, the awakening and the Iraqi government. So that the decline in violence that we now see may in fact be temporary. But beyond that, the question of whether the surge is a success cannot be measured by saying, by, by, by the decline in violence. Because after all, we did not invade Iraq in 2003 to have a decline in violence between Sunnis and Shiites who were not fighting each other in 2003. Success has to be measured against our objectives in Iraq. So what are those objectives? President Bush has defined them as a democratic, stable, and unified Iraq. And we are as far or further today from those objectives than we have ever been. Unity, I've already described it. Kurdistan is independent uh, in everything but name. Sunnis and Shiites, both of them would, Kurds, if you call a Kurd an Iraqi, he's offended. Uh, and if you ask any Kurd, would you rather be, uh, including the president of Iraq, would you rather be a, uh, have an independent Kurdistan or be uh, part of Iraq, uh, they would say they would prefer an independent Kurdistan. Although some would say that's not realistic right now, including the president of Iraq. But that's what they would all like to see. But with regard to Sunnis and Shiites, both of them say they're Iraqi. Their trouble is that they have very different views of what that means. The Shiites believe that their majority entitles them to rule and to define Iraq as a Shiite religious state. The Sunnis, including those who opposed Saddam Hussein, and there were many who did, kept to a man and woman cannot accept that Iraq is defined by a, um, by a branch of Islam that they are not part of. In fact, no more than uh, even a, a, a non-practicing Catholic could accept that the United States was a Protestant state or, or vice versa. Uh, so you, you, you don't, you have, you, there's, you, you have a, a, a part of the country that wants to be independent unanimously, and then two other, the other two components, which are at each other's throats, both armed with their own armies, and which do not have a shared vision of Iraq. I would say that unity is not on the table. What about democracy? I, I already discussed this. Uh, it, it is true that the Shiite religious parties that are in power are there by the free choice of Iraq Shiite majority. But I don't believe that we can claim a success uh, that, uh, for democracy that we uh, have fought and made all this sacrifice to enable parties that have values that are inimical to the ones that we have uh, to come to power, even if they come to power democratically. And as pointed out, in the case of the Sunnis, the people who are now have the upper hand are the very people we invaded Iraq uh, to overthrow. And what, what is, has to be clear is that the current administration has, has no plan, no thought, no strategy, and never has that would involve re removing or do anything to contain the power of the Shiite religious parties who, who run the southern Iraq, who control Baghdad. And of course, they, ha they are the people who have enabled now, who are paying for the Ba'athists who have come back to power in the, in the, in the Sunni uh, areas. Uh, so, what happens? What 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 happens uh, now? What's the what's the way forward? Uh, I think President Obama has campaigned on, or President-elect Obama has campaigned uh, on withdrawal from Iraq over the next 16 months. Uh, and I well, I can't speak to him, but uh, it's almost inconceivable that that is a 
uh, a commitment that he would not keep. Uh, there may be some adjustments. And it is the right thing to do because in terms of U.S. national security, Iraq is a second-tier issue. The first-tier issues are Iran, North Korea, and top of that list is Pakistan, a country that has already has nuclear weapons with a very fragile civilian government which doesn't really control the military, which doesn't really control the very powerful inter-services intelligence, the Pakistani equivalent of the CIA and FBI combined. The inter-services intelligence, ISI, are the people who created the Taliban in 1994. They continue to support the Taliban. They have links, it may be, to Al-Qaeda. The military are the people who control Pakistan's nuclear weapons and who sponsored and participated in, 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 in the operations in which Pakistani nuclear technology was shared with North Korea, I Iran, Libya, and others. Those are the ones we know about, but for sure, that's not the entire list. So it's a very volatile, very dangerous situation in Pakistan uh, uh, that, that we have to uh, be concerned about. Uh, and as long as we are devoting half of our military resources to Iraq, uh, as well as as much money, we are not dealing with Pakistan, we're not dealing with Iran, we're not dealing with North Korea. So it is a diversion of, of resources, and that is, that is the national security argument for getting out of Iraq. What is likely to happen when we get out of Iraq? Well, the situation is not likely to be very different from what it is now. That is to say, the central government and the South will still be controlled by pro-Iranian religious parties, and Iran's influence is very strong in Iraq today, and it will be after we go. Kurdistan will continue to be de facto independent. Uh, its army is stronger than the Iraqi army, and I think that's very much in our interest for that situation to continue. This is the one part of Iraq that's been successful from our point of view, democratic, uh, or aspiring to be democratic, very, very pro-Western. The open question is, what happens to the awakening? And what I would argue is that one of the things that we should do on the way out is to work to uh, either to institutionalize the role of the awakening or to work out a modus vivendi in which territory is defined where the awakening will be responsible for security and territory where the um, Iraqi military will be responsible, where the Shiite Iraqi army will be responsible for security. Uh, incidentally, what does this look like? Basically, it looks like the plan put forward by Vice President Biden, who, who and, and which is contained in the Iraqi Constitution, which allows for powerful regions with their own armies. The Bush administration adopted what was Senator Biden's plan, effectively. The only part they missed was not having a Sunni region. So the, there's the army, but there isn't a civilian authority to be at the head of it. What I would certainly recommend is that we encourage the Sunnis to form their own region so that you have civilian control over the awakening and it's responsible to a governmental institution. Uh, let me just uh, say a word before I turn this over to questions uh, about, uh, sorry, the one other thing that we also ought to do on the way out is try and solve the territorial dispute between Kurds and Arabs. There's a whole swath of territory, beginning at the Syrian border and going to the Iranian border, that from which Kurds, which, which the Kurds would tell you were historically Kurdish, and from which the Kurds were expelled as part of Saddam Hussein's Arabization plan, which Kurds were expelled. Kurds are, of course, non-Arabs, speak a, a language, uh, Indo-European language. Uh, they were the original inhabitants of the area. They, they were expelled and Arab settlers brought in. Uh, and the Kurds want the, this territory back. Some of their claims are very expansive. They would uh, seek territory that go back that hasn't been Kurdish in centuries and that those claims ought to be resisted. But there ought to be a fair adjudication of their claims to territory where people have been expelled in the last generation or so. Uh, and that includes the uh, city of Kirkuk. 
Uh, I'm not saying that it should be part of Kurdistan or it shouldn't, although there's a formula in the Iraqi constitution for a referendum that's supposed to settle its status. But the important point is that there be a process in which this is settled so that you don't have fighting between Kurds and Arabs over territory. And here the US is a place where the US has a lot of leverage because the Kurds have been our allies and uh, uh, they're very, they would like that alliance to continue. So basically what I'm arguing is on the way out of Iraq, let's reduce the number of flashpoints among Iraq's communities. Let's settle the territorial issue between Kurds and Arabs and let's define the role of the awakening. Now let me turn to the country that has won the uh, American-Iraq war, and that, of course, is Iran. What should we do about Iran? Uh, well, the number one issue for us with Iran is not Iraq. Iran's position in Iraq is settled. We enabled them. We actually installed their allies. Uh, and we aren't going to reverse that. The Bush administration has had no intention of doing it, and the Obama administration, I would doubt, is going to try to reverse uh, uh, Iran, Iran's de facto control. Uh, but we, there is, our main security interest is that Iran not have nuclear weapons. Now, what strategies might we adopt to deal with the problem of Iran's nuclear weapons? Iran's nuclear ambitions. Right now, we've, there, have been, there, are, there have been two strategies on the table from the Bush administration. Uh, one is the military option. Uh, and let me be clear, I think we do have a military option. I think by sustained bombing of Iran's nuclear facilities, we can delay Iran indefinitely from acquiring nuclear weapons. It's not that we, we may not know where all these facilities are, and some of them may be buried very deeply, so we may not be able to destroy everything. But the fact is that as long as we are bombing a place, the new scientists, the engineers, the construction workers, they're not going to go to work there. The problem with that is what do we do about the retaliation? Uh, the first place they're going to retaliate is in Iraq, where we have troops. And who will help them retaliate? Our supposed Iraqi allies. Uh, but beyond that, they can close the Strait of Hormuz and disrupt, and take their own oil off the market just by doing that. And we'll all be sitting around, uh, my part of the country, very cold, uh, waxing nostalgically about those happy days. Remember back in the summer of 2008? when gas only cost $4 a gallon, boy, those were the days. Uh, so the, the military option, while it might accomplish our objective, comes at great cost. Now, the other option, which is the one that the Bush administration has effectively adopted, is to talk loudly, it's totally unacceptable for Iran to have nuclear weapons, and to do nothing. And that has been, not surprisingly, completely ineffective. That leaves the third option, uh, which I have recommended and which uh, President-elect Obama has talked about, which is negotiating. Now, there are two issues of, about negotiation. First, is a deal possible? And second, should we, should we in fact engage in negotiations with Iran? Uh, Yes, I think a deal is possible. In fact, in 2003, the Iranians, through the Swiss ambassador, Tim Guldeman, uh, sent a non-paper. This is a diplomatic speak for uh, some ideas that a government puts forward, but there, it doesn't have any heading on it, and so that if necessary, they can deny it. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a way to float an idea in, in, diplomatically and, and, and see if it flies. This non-paper proposed the following deal. Uh, Iran would continue with its nuclear program, but would agree to whatever kind of inspection, what, how fully intrusive, to provide full assurance to the United States that its nuclear program was for peaceful purposes. Whatever inspections, whatever monitoring, uh, whatever kind of controls. 
Second, Iran would cooperate fully against al-Qaeda. Third, Iran would stop the support for Hezbollah and Hamas uh, uh, in Israel proper. And in return, Iran asked that it not be part of the axis of evil, be taken out of the axis of evil, uh, that, um, it, uh, that sanctions be lifted, and that the U.S. cooperate against the Mujahideen Khalq, which is an, Ir an Iranian opposition group that we consider to be a terrorist organization, which is in, based in Iraq. That was the bargain. Now, uh, there, that wasn't a perfect deal, but it wasn't necessarily a bad one. It's not clear that all the authorities in Iran had signed on to it. But it was a, a basis for a negotiation. And in my view, that's a deal, something along those lines, is clearly a better alternative to the military option because of the retaliation and better option to doing nothing. But full of mission accomplished, the, because this was May 2003, the Bush administration said, we do not negotiate with evil. Let me just ask, should we negotiate with evil? Well, as ambassador to Croatia, I negotiated with Slobodan Milosevic, Franjo Tudjman, Milan Martic, who was the head of the rebel Serbs. Uh, Martic, I, I later testified in a genocide trial against Milosevic and in a crimes against humanity trial against Martic, and Tudjman would have been in the Hague if he hadn't died. Uh, so, yeah, we negotiated with evil, but we were tough. We insisted on our principles. We got a deal that ended the war, and at the end of the war, the criminals ended up going to, to court. Uh, President Bush compared Obama's plan to uh, going to, to Chamberlain, going to Munich to negotiate with Hitler. Another this his historical uh, center, I, uh, history center, I have to say, another pro world, a flawed World War II analogy. There was nothing wrong with Chamberlain going to Munich to meet with Hitler or to negotiate with him. In fact, if he had been a tough negotiator, maybe World War II might have been avoided. The problem with what Chamberlain did is he went to Munich and gave Hitler Czechoslovakia. That was the problem. So, in my view, there's nothing wrong with negotiating with, with evil regimes. It is a question of how you negotiate. And may, negotiating with Iran may or may not work. But compare this to the alternatives. And let me just conclude. Uh, and my father, who lectured for many years, said you always should include in your speeches phrases like, let me conclude, or finally, it gives your audience hope. <laughs> let me conclude, though, by saying, uh, and I talk about this in the book, it's, we, it seems to me we need a fundamental return to, to, to basic principles of national security, which have been missing for the last eight years, and that is to be pragmatic, to prioritize our national security resources. Let's look at the most serious dangers. Uh, let's apply the, 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 the resources to the most serious problems. Uh, let, us, let, us not, let us not substitute wishful thinking and ideology for an understanding of the situation on the ground. And I guess the final lesson I'd say, next time we invade a country, let's learn, know something about it before we go in. Let me take your questions. unless you're agreeing with me right. or promoting the book, then you can talk as long as you want.
I think Israel would try to act in what it sees is in its interest. Uh, and Israel's very concerned about an Iranian nuclear weapon. There are logistical questions about whether Israel is capable of flying as, you know, whether it's all the way to Iran, making the strikes and getting back. And remember, I, I don't think this, this isn't like the bombing in 1981 of the Iraqi Osirak reactor, which was a one-shot deal. And if you're going to stop Iran, this is going to be sustained. Uh, the problem that we have is that if the uh, Israelis do it, the Iranians will certainly think that we were in cahoots with the Israelis. And so the retaliation that I described would happen. Um, it may be that the Israelis calculate that. And so uh, if you had a different government in Israel, there might be a more hardline one, that they would figure that uh, they could do it, the Iranians would retaliate against the US, and then we would strike. Uh, so, uh, but as to what we do if negotiation doesn't work, I, I will respectfully decline to answer that. I would like to see first if negotiation can work. I don't, you know, let, let's not, we, we can't have blind faith in negotiation. But let us, con it, it is only, it's, it's, a, it's a, a better, cheaper course of action than any other. And it's certainly the, the, the current policy of doing nothing hasn't worked. Talking tough and doing nothing hasn't worked. And the military option is very unattractive. Um, the, 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 problem, the, the problem is that with the all-volunteer force uh, and the smaller size of the military when you don't have a draft military and therefore you can have draftees doing you know, KP, kitchen police duty, you then have to end up outsourcing. Uh, and I, I suppose I don't see, I mean, I, I think this is inevitable and, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with having um, contractors, you know, helping to build bases, uh, setting up Burger Kings and recreational facilities. Um, but I think there's an enormous problem when you outsource security. Uh, and we've seen this in Iraq. We've made a lot of enemies in Iraq by unnecessarily, by killing Iraqi civilians, uh, uh, all of that's you know, tragic and wrong, but a lot of it was unnecessary, and, and for the most part, it has not been done by the military, it's been done by these private contractors. But the Iraqis don't make that distinction. So I think that's a part of the outsourcing that really, in my view, has to be rethought. But you know, given the, how stretched our armed forces are, uh, this is going to require a lot of a lot of thinking. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your service to the country. Some of us may not be aware that your service has involved actually great physical courage as well as intellectual courage. My question is, uh, will we and uh, should we keep our bases in Iraq? Thank you for your kind words. Uh, uh, the answer to that is no on both accounts. I, I think this has always been a phony issue about permanent bases in Iraq. Uh, I mean, we built, we built large bases because that's how we operate. Uh, but they, they were never going to be permanent in the sense that we were going to have an election which had a very good chance of bringing in a president who was determined to get the U.S. out of Iraq. And of course, that's exactly what happened. And then there's the fact that the Iraqis would like us to leave. Um, and and it's like that's a part of the story that is worth uh, perhaps a word. You'll notice last summer that when Senator Obama went to Baghdad, Prime Minister Maliki said, yeah, his withdrawal plan's about right. Now, 
the neoconservatives uh, afterwards were a little shocked and they said, oh, well, this is only because Maliki thinks Obama's going to win and he wants to make good with the new guy, but he really doesn't mean it. And uh, some of the others said, oh, it's because Maliki wants to play to Iraqi public opinion where the U.S. occupation is unpopular, but he really doesn't mean it. And then some of the Bush people said that ungrateful SOB, off the record, of course. Um, but the fourth possibility was that he really did mean it. And if he does want the U.S. out, why? Because he's a sectarian Shiite politician. And when the U.S. was, from 2003 to 2006, when the U.S. was fighting the Sunnis, they were very happy to have the U.S. there. But when we started financing the Sunnis in 2007, then we were financing a, 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 a militia that they see as a threat. And they know they can't deal with the awakening until we're gone. And that, in my view, is why they want us gone. Well, in, in, in defense of the American people, they didn't actually elect Bush in 2000. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and, and I, have, I have to say, I certainly I think it was a great blow to our reputation worldwide when it became clear that we didn't have an independent judiciary but a politically partisan one, because I don't think there's anybody here or abroad who thinks the court would have reached the same decision if the role of the two candidates had been reversed. But that's, and, and, but let, let, me, let me come to your question. Um, at the top level, we're here uh, because we had, we elected an administration, uh, or an administration came to office, let's put it that way. Uh, an administration came to office with smart people in it but who, who basically were, who spent their entire careers as partisans and advocates of their cause, as ideologues. And it, when it came to the Iraq war, the Cheneys, the Rumsfelds, the Wolfowitz, the Fifes, put all their energy into making the case for the war. As I said earlier, the Iraqis are the Germans of the Middle East. Uh, when when we get rid of their Hitler, democracy will come easily, just as it did in Germany. Uh, the, um, the Shiites, uh, if they're in a pro-Western country liberated by the U.S., they'll, and, and they control the holy places of Shia Islam, that will undermine Iran. Uh, it's going to be easy. We don't need to have a, a large number, a large force go in there. And they were so focused on making the case for war and so used to that kind of, of a partisan battle that they didn't realize they had a responsibility for the war and, and for what followed. And, and it's, it's just stunning. Uh, they didn't begin planning for the post-war occupation until mid-January, so about six weeks before the war began. They didn't choose the man who was going to head the post-war occupation, Jerry Bremer, until the end of April, three weeks after we took Baghdad. And they chose somebody based on his hardline Republican credentials. He had never been to Iraq. He had never served in the Middle East. He had no experience in post-conflict management. So that's the, that's the top level. But I want to come back to your colleagues, your, your PhD students who were in the State Department, the CIA. They knew that this was wrong. 
Uh, and that actually includes also the generals. And they did not stand up and say it. And that's because in Washington, the conventional wisdom carries the day, and, and people are very reluctant to, to challenge the conventional wisdom. And so when uh, the other thing that these ideologues at the top were doing is, of course, the, they were scaring themselves. They were scaring themselves about all the threats that Iraq posed. Um, and there, there were people clearly who knew that Iraq didn't have, it, 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 nobody knew that, or very, that Iraq didn't have WMD, but, but any sensible strategist knew that Iraq did not have WMD that threatened the US. Anybody knew that once you had the inspectors back, there's no chance Iraq had a nuclear program. Why? Because nuclear programs require large facilities that you cannot hide. It couldn't have had an ongoing chemical weapons program, same reason. Might have had some chemical weapons hidden away, but they wouldn't have been usable and they wouldn't have been making new ones. And the analysts knew this, or when it came to the number of troops. I mean, General Shinseki said the truth, obviously, he said three or 400,000 troops. And of course, he was shot down by, by Wolfowitz uh, and Rumsfeld. Uh, uh, but of course, you, know, you have to understand what happened. Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz thought Shinseki was undermining their case for war. Shinseki thought he was offering military advice about how many troops were needed. But the fact is that the top generals didn't then stand up for Shinseki. They didn't say this is wrong. And so they bear some responsibility as well. I have a whole chapter on this, so I encourage you to buy and read the book. <laughs> uh, but sure, we need more people in government of those PhDs and in the top ranks of the military and diplomacy who are outliers who are prepared to stand up and challenge the conventional wisdom, please. Right, precisely, excluded a, a, a significant part of our citizens from basic civil rights until 40 years ago, and arguably, <laughs> that process of exclusion didn't end until you, know, you had this remarkable event a week ago of, of an election of an African-American as president of the United States. Um, independent of whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, uh, or whether you like Obama or not, it's just that it is a sign of the evolution of our democracy. And so, uh, as incidentally, is also a sign, uh, and to his credit, that President Bush appointed two uh, uh, African-American secretaries of state and had an African-American national security advisor. So I think it is, we, we as a country are in a process of evolution and I'm, I'm really proud of where we've arrived. Uh, but I think it's an ongoing process. Uh, I, I think it's, um, uh, but, but it, one of the things is that we're a country and a place like Iraq really isn't. Uh, we, we are all Americans, but uh, Iraqis, the, the people of Iraq are really Kurds and Arabs, and, and the Arabs are Sunnis and Shiites. Well, the, the, the first point is that John McCain did call the Biden plan a cockamamie idea, but as I tried to describe, it is, exactly, it is basically what the Bush administration did. The Biden idea was you'd have three regions with their own governments and responsible for their own security, with their own armies, which is what the Iraqi constitution allows. Well, we, in the case of the Sunnis, we have the army without the political control, but, but in terms of, and, and it, it is the fact that the Sunnis are run, running their own security is why we've made uh, the progress. Um, the, the, the core of the problem is not what people understood in, in 2000 and, and, and 
2005 or 2006, and I, I read State of Denial, and naturally I read that particular passage with a reference to my book with great interest and deeply approving of that Rumsfeld aide who obviously got it a little late, but got it. Um, it's, it's what happened in 2003 before we went in. I, every, every military person I've met in Iraq, and I've met with many of them, they, they all complete, there, there's not, there was very few who disagree with what I've said about the nature of the country. Why? Because they're on the ground and they know it. Um, but in, in 2003, uh, I, I tell a story in, in my first book, The End of Iraq, which has been a story that's been misinterpreted, actually, and I'll explain why of three Iraqi Americans, two of them were good friends of mine, meeting with President Bush in January of 2003. They were strong supporters of the war. They wanted Saddam gone. Uh, and they naturally got into a discussion. What was Iraq going to be like after Saddam was gone? They started talking about Sunnis and Shiites. And it was clear to them the president was unfamiliar with these terms. He didn't know that Islam was divided into these two groups. And of course, you can't anticipate that one of the consequences of your action is a civil war between two groups that you didn't know existed. Um, but I, I, tell, I did not tell that story uh, in order to make fun of the president or to, to diminish him, um, although I think he should have been better informed. Uh, I told that story because it is so, such an example of the failure to, to plan for the day after. It's, it was an example because you, you couldn't have had a nat, uh, you know, meeting of the top level of the National Security Council without this issue coming up. They, did they just, at the highest levels, they never addressed it. And that is what I consider to be grossly irresponsible. The uh, Democrats have been out of power for eight years now. And I'm wondering what your assessment is of the quality of the, uh, the pool of advisors and potential candidates Um, boy, I'm not going to go to there on the second one. Uh, and and uh, I actually think the, the Democrats have a very good uh, bench in terms of national security. Uh, the, the, the people who are mentioned are, are some of them I know very well. Richard Holbrook was the negotiator of the Dayton Peace Agreement, my, my colleague. Um, superb, gets things done. Uh, I worked for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee with John Kerry, also mentioned for Secretary of State. Uh, he's you know, very knowledgeable, uh, uh, very analytical. I worked with Joe Biden, who will play, I hope and expect, a big role. He's very strong. Uh, Greg Craig, I've known for years. He worked for Kennedy, was head of policy planning, maybe the national security advisor, very bright. Jim Steinberg, who is deputy national security advisor in Clinton too, very capable. Uh, and I could go on with a very long list. Uh, Samantha Power up at the Kennedy School, who was a, I met as a journalist when she was in Bosnia, one of the brightest people I know, uh, written a couple of uh, really superb votes and books, and I hope, I hope she'll be involved and bring the kind of outlier perspective that is needed. It depends, <laughs> it depends on what happens. Um, if you can get a modus, if you can solve the problem between the Kurds and the Arabs, if you can solve the problem between the Sunnis and the Shiites, uh, then I think they, they are not going to be a threat at home, and if there's not a threat at home, it's less of a likely of a threat abroad. Uh, the fact that the Shiites are aligned with Iran would be less of a problem if Iran was less of a problem. Uh, and it may be by negotiating with Iran, and incidentally, the prospect that the Iranians will, will change or alter their regime, because they tend not to be very happy with this system, uh, uh, that, could, that could change the dynamic. Incidentally, I'm quite, a, quite opposed to U.S. involvement with regime change in Iran, because the Iranian opposition doesn't want our support, it's counterproductive, and because we're so hopelessly ineffective at it. But I, I think, 
like, I, I'm in favor of regime change in Iran. I'm just not in favor of us trying to, to sponsor it. So I can, I can see a situation where, uh, where the situation evolves well, and I unfortunately can see uh, much dimmer scenarios. I, I'm gonna, can I just take the, the two, uh, since my colleague there was also in Iraq, and I think it's fair to let him have a question. Go ahead. Mr. Ambassador, please comment on the proposition that to the extent that it's important for a great pilot to go to war, it is important to have a conscription. Um, I'm, I'm against conscription. Uh, and I, th I think the, the, almost the entire military is against conscription because the nature of warfare is different from what it was when you wanted to raise mass armies beginning in Napoleon's time and uh, going through um, the Second World War and even Vietnam. It, what, what you require from the military now is, uh, is, an, is, is enormous training. Um, people can handle very sophisticated equipment. Um, and. You, you aren't going to be able to get that easily with conscripts. So I think it's, it's basically uh, not a good idea, and the professional military is against it, and countries that have conscription are largely abandoning. It's also incredibly expensive. You like the current budget deficit? Just wait until you think what you have to do with, with conscripts and GI Bill and all that. Please. And, and incidentally, we're thinking of them. Uh, and uh, I think whatever the views that people have on the war, they are in, uh, very much appreciative, uh, obviously, of the service and sacrifice of, of the true professionals. And they've been professionals from day one, which is our military. I want to ask you some questions for a second, so don't. Um, but yeah, sure, sure, the Libya thing is is a very positive development. Uh, it has a, a long history that goes back before the invasion of Iraq, so it's a little hard to argue cause and effect. Uh, but nonetheless, if if the uh, intimidation factor that it came about with Iraq worked on Libya, I'm prepared to give it credit. But the the problem is. That it didn't deal with them. I mean, Libya was still a long way from nuclear weapons, and a lot of what they had was basically worthless. It hasn't dealt with the real threats Iran, North Korea, Pakistan. Now, uh, what I wanted to ask you uh, uh, is if you don't mind, uh, uh, do you believe that Nouri al Maliki, the prime minister of Iraq, is a Democrat? And if so, what is it in his background that you see? And there's been an assertion, a continual assertion, by the Bush administration, this guy's a Democrat. He's a, a sectarian Shiite politician with authoritarian tendencies uh, who is backed by Iran and, um, and uh, Syria. And the second question is, on the unity of Iraq, 
why should we Americans, why should you be fighting to keep the Kurds, who unanimously don't want to be part of Iraq and who are pro-Western, in Iraq? Why is that in our national interest? Why should you be sacrificing for that particular goal? I didn't say United Kurd. You mean United with Turkey and all that? Well, not only that, but that's when you bring in the point. Turkey and Iran yeah. is not allowed. Turkey is the diametrically opposed and runs operations to this day inside the territory limits of Iraq to try to make sure that the Kurds understand that they will not be united, that they will not take over southern Turkey, that it would be a lot of people believe, and I guess reasonable people can disagree, and that's fine, not being disagree. <laughs> But uh, there are reasonable people who can believe that if you do allow Kurdistan to become as autonomous as maybe is, as maybe you suggest, that Turkey would would automatically, and they've said as much, would oppose that. Um, as for your first question, whether Al Maliki is a Democrat, I don't know. I don't believe he's a Jeffersonian Democrat. I don't believe uh, he he would he would follow Rousseau and all the all the great ideas that we all kind of hope when we start a democracy. But is he is he somebody that can bring democratic principles, or at least, or at least, uh, at least keep the country in that in that going that direction? Who knows? But I know I saw, I saw this. I was in Iraq for three elections: the the ratification of the constitution, and uh, the first the, the the referendum, the election of the constitution, and then the election of the people that ran the country. And a lot of people stood in a lot of lines all day long at great personal risk for this opportunity. It was a dramatic. It was a dramatic moment in Iraq, and I don't know if Al Maliki's going to do this. I know this. My three-star general, who I served over there, always said this. He said, "Guys, you cannot win this war in Iraq. You can't win. You can screw it up and lose it for but you can't win. But what you can do is set the condition by which the Iraqi people can have the best hope in this for a generation of freedom." And I believe the American troops and our allies over there have done that. I think we've given them the best hope. Well, so whether they grab it, whether they take hold of it and keep it. That's up to them, and only time will tell. But I believe that the American troops have done that much to give the Iraqi people a great amount of hope. Let, let me, let me just, let me. Let, let, let me comment on that because this is something I say in the book, and I think it's an important point, and it goes to the core of my criticism. I believe that the Iraqi, or the people of Iraq, and I, I use the term Iraqi people, but there's no such thing. I believe that the peoples of Iraq are much better off because of what the United States has done and what U.S. troops have done. Simple math, 80% of them are Shiites or Kurds. The Kurds have what they always wanted, a de facto independent state. The Shiites now rule Iraq. The question is whether the U.S. is better off. And is it, is it our mission in the world to go out uh, and bring democracy to other countries, and if not, if Iraq, then where else? In circumstances where the people who emerged from those elections, freely chosen, were people who's, who want to create an Iranian-style theocracy. Um, that's the... I mean, after all, should we go into Iran and then have elections? Ahmadinejad is a, a freely elected president. I wouldn't want to be sending you to Iran to create a situation where Ahmadinejad wins elections. So I, I think that, that that goes to the core of, of the disagreement that, that I would have with you. Uh, it, it is indisputably, in my view, that true that Iraqis, or at least 80% of them, are better off. But that, to my mind, U.S. national security is about the United States. And it's our national security that has ended up being worse off. But anyhow, thank you, uh, and I'm glad we had a chance to have this colloquy. Thank <laughs> you.